Hey, what's up, everyone? This is Takatoshi Shibayama, the host of the Future Design Podcast. There are new industries and jobs being created. As automation speeds up, more jobs will be destroyed and new ones created. If you're working on a job that you think softwares and robotics can do, chances are you won't be in that role in the next few years. So how do you know if you'll be fit for a new profession that doesn't exist yet? There's really no job description or precedent. You'll have to use any skill sets you have, piece them together, and mold into that job. In this episode, I speak with Michael Pachin, CEO of Mountain Maid. He jumped into the world of cannabis early on when the laws were still gray. Up until this day, it's still not black and white. There are many industries like this. This is a story of Michael, who had to keep reshaping his skill sets in order to survive in this ever-changing sector. This may be the mindset that you'll need in a not-too-distant future. So without further ado, here is Michael Pachin. Future Design Podcast. Well, thank you, Mike Pachin, for being on our show. Yeah, Taka, thank you so much for having me. I'm looking forward to, to uh, a great discussion tonight. Great. And you've been on the forefront of the cannabis industry starting out in Colorado. And recently we've seen cannabis being slowly st- starting up in Asia. In Japan, I, th- I think six, seven years ago, CBD products started showing up in e-commerce sites. And, and I think now with South Korea and Thailand open up for medical marijuana, I think the industry is about to explode here. So what I wanted to talk to you is about professionalism in the cannabis industry. Now, you've been in this industry, you told me from the beginning. So I wanted to talk to you about first, um, can you tell us about uh, yourself first? Yeah, yeah, great. So uh, I'll start at the beginning. My name is Mike Patchen. I was born and raised in a little town in Ohio, Canton, Ohio. Um, Grew up and, uh, you know, growing up, I I remember kind of sneaking around and seeing magazines, high time magazines. And and we used to, you know, joke as kids, like how cool that would be if it was legal. And, you know, it was was a mystic thing, uh, cannabis. Uh, jumped into college in a program that was centered for pharmaceuticals. So I was going to be a pharmaceutical salesperson. And it was really interesting. A couple of adults around me, uh, one fellow that I grew up working uh, side by side with at a greenhouse doing lawn and landscape said, you'll, you'll never be a pharmaceutical sales rep. Something's going to happen in your life where it's going to detour. And, 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 you know, at that time at 18 coming out of Ohio, I thought, nah, nah, you know, got to stay on that short and narrow path and now I'm going to be successful. And my third year in college, I uh, jumped ship one night, got in a car with some buddies, drove across to another state to see uh, a concert. And on the way home, we got pulled over traffic stop and I had a half gram of marijuana cannabis in my pocket, you know, so very, very small amount. And they took it very, very seriously. And I was arrested and, uh, you know, sent to jail for the night, had to go to court, and they wanted me to go to jail for six months. Um, in order to beat the jail time, I agreed with the judge to get back into college, move home, get on the, the, the straight and narrow path. And I did. I, I left pharmacy school, went into business school, fell in love with business school, uh, graduated college. I was, in, I was arrested in 2003, graduated college in 2006, took a job as a salesperson for three years. Um, had an awesome phone call from a friend and said, Hey, you know, drop out of that, move out to Telluride, Colorado, come ski for a year, relax, see what you really want to do in life. And, uh, that was a wonderful experience because that summer is when I got my start in the cannabis space in 2010. And the, the reason I like to tell that story is it's just, my life has came so full circle, you know, I'm from a really hardworking town in Canton, Ohio, as a kid looking at high times magazine being arrested for using cannabis in college to now 10 years in the cannabis space, uh, owner operator of two small businesses, uh, the CBD company, we're putting CBD into tablets, Uh, not quite at what you would call pharmaceutical level, but very interesting that, you know, I was in pharmaceutical sales, super science based, and now both my companies revolve around cannabis, CBD, science, knowledge, patient advocacy, help, you know, I've, I've been helping people through cannabis and hemp for over 10 years, very similar to like I was going to school for uh, when I got caught smoking cannabis in, in pharmacy school 17 years ago. Um, 
So that's just a little bit about my background and kind of how I've gotten to where I'm at and why I'm so passionate about what I do. 10 years in cannabis seems like almost 50 years in a normal industry and with so many totally. things happening uh, over the years. So you, as you said, you were been in this industry for 10 years. I mean, how, how did Colorado come about to legalize cannabis? Yeah, you know, so it was through, you know, a lot of folks were getting together and, you know, Colorado just seems to be in the forefront of uh, quite a bit. And, and I'll be honest, you know, when you say I'm one of the originals, I am and I'm not because there was a lot of people before me who pushed uh, actively to get the medical marijuana uh, not only approved, but into the Constitution. So it's embedded into the state constitution of Colorado, which has really solidified us. And in the early days, you know, it gave us a safe um, uh, foothold because, you know, you look at a, a state like California who just had it as a proposition and you still saw a lot of federal raids. Well, being that, you know, the people before myself who allowed me to do what I do got it embedded into the state constitution. And it started slowly, you know, as caregivers and cultivation um, in, 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 in very, I don't want to say low level, but, you know, in, in a seed level position. And then it grew, it cultivated. So by 2009, when I got that phone call, when I was in my original job, out of college and I said man what's the marijuana scene like out there and he said shops are opening I'll never forget my buddy saying that shops are opening we can go get our medical card and we can walk into a shop and legally purchase cannabis and I'll never forget on the phone I thought man I got to get a part of that you know I'll come all the way out there just to try and accomplish that and, and it was apparently my path because once I got out here in less than six months I had entered the industry and you know 10 coming on 11 years later, I haven't left. So it took a lot of grassroots movement. And when it initially started, you know, it was essentially glorified drug dealing to a lot of people. You know, we had licenses, we had some rules and regs, but we were mapping out the systems as we were going forward, you know, so it was like the toothpaste had came out of the tube and then we were figuring out what to do with it because you can't get it back in the tube. And it was, you know, supported quite a bit by the by the people of Colorado. And, you know, and again, at that time, it really hadn't made national news in a sense. So it was still kind of looked down upon and shunned by a lot of the other states uh, in the U.S. And it took a lot of grit to, to stick it out those first couple of years to all of us. Um, and a lot of people, especially the owners, and I was not an owner at that time, the owners of the licenses for cultivation and dispensaries, really were under a tight microscope and considered high-level felons um, at that time. Anyone in the industry, really, but, the, you know, the owners, the people that really signed that in-depth paperwork really put their necks on the line, and, and we're all thankful for, for the people who, who did that. And when was this exactly? Because uh, I remember watching a documentary before about the legalization of cannabis in Colorado and uh, initially, there were a lot of shops opening up, but there were so many people who were in the neighborhood or against it. Uh, banks didn't want to deal with you guys. I mean, you know, how, how, how did the industry really look like in the early days? Yeah, so I want to say it was 2005 through 2007 is when the legislation kind of came on the books. And then it took a little bit of time before you saw shops and cultivators actually open. Um, I stepped in in 2010, and that's right close to the beginning of it. There had been shops open for, you know, a year and a half, two years previous to that. To give you an example, in 2011, the state issued a, a badge. You had to go and everyone had to sign a bunch of paperwork, and they issued you a badge. Similar to if you ever go to Las Vegas, uh, like a blackjack dealer has to go through a background check, and then they issue them a license to be a uh, um a car dealer in Vegas. Well, they did similar to us in the cannabis space. And there was only 2,500 of us employed in the industry in 2011. So from 2005, when it really kind of started till 2011, there was only 2,500 of us in the state of Colorado employed in the cannabis space. Now there's around 120, 130,000 uh, folks, you know, just 11 years later. Um, but it, it, it looked a lot different back then. Um, you know, it was, 
it, it was a lot less organized. And again, you know, we were still kind of feeling our way through what rules and regs were needed. Where were we going to self-regulate versus where did the state need to step in? And a lot of the regulations we didn't even realize you could accomplish. You know, when the industry first started, there was no real way to test for potency, let alone for microbial residual solvents, heavy metals, pesticides. So it was young, it was in its infancy, and it was really open to interpretation and exploration. Yeah, I remember in uh, in the late 90s, California opened up for legal, uh, legal med- <clears throat> medicinal marijuana. And I think that kind of opened the way for not just the U.S., for a lot of Western countries to decriminalize or, or legalize uh, medicinal ma- marijuana. Now, it, you mentioned that there were no industries that could check the quality of these uh, marijuana products. Now, it's not probably just the the uh, science behind it, but even the infrastructure that supports the industry. So I mentioned about banking, uh, I mentioned about rents, uh, neighborhood acceptance, all these things. I mean, how did that look like? Yeah, so it was interesting. Um, You know, my Facebook, when I was on social media, a lot of us were using monikers. So, you know, my, I changed my last name from my actual last name, Patchen, to TV, if you've ever seen Willy Wonka. Uh, the little fella in the cowboy hat, they call him Mike TV. Um, I went with that moniker because when you would go to apply for an apartment, your landlord would check your social media. And if, if you were in the cannabis industry, a lot of them would say no because they didn't want to accept your money because at that time, even if a landlord was accepting your money, the landlord could lose their bank because you were associated with the marijuana industry Um, banks wouldn't touch you at all you know you really had to be sneaky about how you went in and if you had envelopes of cash because a lot of the companies were cash run Um, you know if your check said anything relative to cannabis they would shut even your personal account down so the, the optics were just a lot different again we were seen as glorified drug dealers um the neighborhoods pushed back Originally, they had said 500 feet from a school. They extended that to 1,000, and that shut, you know, maybe a dozen or so shops down the day that that rule passed. Um, It was a little nitpicky at first. You know, people who may not have liked the industry would find a small, uh, you know, nuance to approach um, and say, ah, you know, this parking lots just not right or you know you would see some of the inspectors come into especially the cultivation sites and let's say you know something in in your electric panel that would have passed muster in a dairy operation they'd nitpick it and say well this exact setup can't run all these grow lights and you'd say well what's the precedent when have you seen it fail and they'd say you know if you argue with me we can shut all of your business down Or we can turn your lights off today and you can fix it. Well, fix is six weeks out and it's a grow. You can't just shut your lights off for six weeks and they would force that. Mm -hmm. So the early adopters, you know, were really subject to that nitpickiness until it normalized and that took years, you know, to do so. So it was super interesting to watch what people... Uh, picked at and and who picked it what Um, I mean the IRS has thrown form 8300 at us which is if you do a cash exchange at ten thousand dollars or greater and you don't have the proper paperwork they were coming after people we kind of call it the flavor of the month it's not every month but it just seems randomly things pop up and they would come after us and then people would lose interest and it would die off and then the next thing would pop up and Um, and you'll have that in any industry, but especially is something that can be as controversial as cannabis being that it's always been seen as a a drug, especially a scheduled one drug. And now it's normalizing into more of a utility tool for people in their daily lives. And it's just slowly evolving, you know, physically and mentally kind of along that, that path It's maturing itself. And, as you said, I mean, in the early days, a lot of people saw you as glorified drug dealers. And 
I'm sure even in Asia right now, people are looking at it and say, well, you know, these people are opportunists. You know, they're probably the same. You know, they were drug dealers before and now they want to get into this or they're not even part of this industry, but they just see the money that's being made in the U.S. and Canada and say, oh, you know, I want to take this chance, make it big, but I just want to, you know, make quick money and get out of it. So I'm sure you've seen a lot of people similar to that well, uh, when you were starting out as well. I mean, can you tell us the types of businesses that really didn't make it out in the early days? Yeah, and I think really the type of business that doesn't make it in cannabis at all are the people who see it as a quick buck. I mean, there's no real quick buck in small business, let alone a small business in an infant industry that's maturing. Also, it just seems that the cannabis space sort of have a, has an energy or a karmic value to it. Most of the people who have came in and said, I'm going to be the Sam Walton or the Jeff Bezos or the Michael Jordan or the LeBron James of cannabis have failed completely. And it just seems, you know, the people who talk the most fail the hardest and the quickest. There's so much opportunity in this industry. You're better off coming in saying, I'm going to be the, the, the first Taka or the first Mike Patton of the industry rather than trying to push something into the industry. It's just not a fit. Um, a lot of the people who have been successful in the industry did have a little bit of, I won't say a shady background, but you know, m maybe they were taking high risk or living a high risk lifestyle before they legitimized with a proper cannabis license. And they did really well because the industry is similar to, you know, like a street life where it has a flow to it. And if you go with the flow and enter the chaos and you can manage it, you can do very well. But if you try and block that chaos and fight upstream or across stream, it's going to wash you out pretty quickly. Um, I mean, it's 730 my time. I've been up since 5 a.m. I drove eight hours today. Uh, I did $20,000, $25,000 in deals. I got paid cash. I had all that cash on me. I returned it to my vendors. You know, I've talked with a dozen different people. I was dropping off hats and swag. You know, I fit in the industry and the industry fits with me. And I just know how to manage the chaos that's brought to my desk and my small businesses every day. So I've, I've been successful. Some of the more clean cut people whose business experience has been more organized, more polished, uh, more thorough, don't succeed because they think they're going to, you can bring some of those skill sets into the industry, but you can also force them and it's a, a square peg round hole scenario and it can cause a lot of friction. There's a certain amount of chaos that you have to be able to live in and function in, and then you can be super successful. It almost seems like my job when I was uh, in the blockchain industry really knee, uh, knee deep in because I came from the hedge fund industry, very clean cut. Well, I mean, at least in the surface, clean cut industry with a lot of intellectual people. And then you go into this newly created industry where you have all sorts of people from you know different backgrounds and you just need to figure out your your foothold in that area because you're dealing with so many people that you never met with before so many different types of people and i kind of think that the cannabis industry is kind of the same like that you see very uh business oriented people and then you see as you say glorified drug dealers as well at the same time all doing trying to do business together so i guess you need to find some kind of middle ground in that and you need a bit of humility you need a little discipline i, I guess that's kind of what you're, tr you're trying to say yeah absolutely and i think blockchain is is super relevant you know because think about when blockchain and crypto first came out i mean how many people were throwing nose down onto that industry and there's a very few people who got it and they pursued it and it was just totally different and you had to be able to wrap your mind around that and and, and see the light at the end of that chaotic tunnel i think i think it's super relevant and to your hedge fund point um you know my small business now i've scaled it down um I exited due to some partner issues, but when my business partner and I were running it together, it was very successful. We had 15 employees. And when we would bring new salespeople on, we would see a lot of folks respond to our ads and they were suit and tie people, 
you know, high level sales folks. And I would say the same thing to every one of them in the first interview. I'd get to the end of the interview and I'd show up like this, right? I earned that. You know, I built a multi-million dollar business. I was showing up in flannels or t-shirts and hats. It's how I like to roll. And I'd say, today, I'm going to do you a, a big favor. I'd say, what? And I'd say, I'm not going to hire you. You don't want to do this. Don't throw your life away. And I'd say, what do you mean? You, you're doing great. And I said, right, but I'm a puzzle piece that fits in this crazy puzzle that never actually fits together. And you're looking to be a fit. And you don't even get that there's no fit. This thing doesn't, it's, it's chaos. I want you to think for a week and call me back and I want you to talk yourself out of it. <laughs> and most of them would, you know, and, and I would just say, don't ruin that beautiful resume that you have. It's, it's, man, I'm jealous of you. Look at that NBA. Like you, you're, you live in a non chaotic world. You don't want this circus because you got to love the circus to want to show up every day. And most of them wanted that surface level glorification they didn't want to be behind the elephant scooping it up every day. You know, and if you're not really ready to do that for something even similar to blockchain and take heat for years from people and scoop behind the elephant because you really want to do it, new industries just aren't for you. But if you have that passion, new industry is so phenom so phenomenal to be in. To give a little bit of light to people who are like in business suits or, you know, they were running some black market type of business. I mean, trying to fit into this puzzle that doesn't really fit. Can you give me some one example so that people can really understand what you're talking about? Yeah. So, you know, it's just. It's so think about, you know, if if I make soda, right. And I deliver it to your convenience store and the order is wrong. I forgot one soda bottle. In any other industry, you just mark it off the invoice, rewrite it, we're done. In the cannabis space, that makes the entire order non-compliant. Not illegal, but non-compliant. If we don't walk through seven, eight different steps to adjust that, and a lot of the adjustment is having to retrace the entire delivery route to a T, taking it back to its starting point, scrapping the original paperwork, completely redoing it, and then traveling back that same path to you in a dedicated amount of time, it's wrong. Mm -hmm. It's wrong, wrong. So having to function inside that tight of parameters for very simple things is outside of most people's realms because it mountains are made from molehills in this industry. And as soon as you nail down that pathway, the next week the state's going to re-regulate and it's all going to be wrong all over again. Every time you nail something down, the state half changes it. We've had companies that have spent, you know, 20 grand buying labels ahead of time. And a month later, the state says that the font that says THC needs to be a half point bigger. Mm. So you scrap those labels, you go out and you get more. Two months later, they say they want it highlighted now. So you either got to scrap the labels or pay someone to take a highlighter and highlight it. And it's just constantly moving and evolving. So as soon as you think the puzzle will fit together, so I mean, even just with COVID, they changed how we were able to service customers four times in two months and two of the original solutions pre-COVID were completely illegal, not non-compliant, completely illegal. And overnight, they changed them to adapt. And we were getting emails at 9 p.m. saying, tomorrow, do it this way. And you're like, okay. So you had to show up in the morning and recreate your business just to stay ahead of the pandemic. But we were all kind of laughing, not at the pandemic, but it, the, the craziness going, man, if there's any industry capable of handling this, it's us because, I mean, we're, we're just constantly used to it. Think about in hedge fund, how much chaos it would have caused your office if you guys would have showed up on a Tuesday and the CEO would have walked in and said, oh, the, the bank just shut us down. We don't have a bank account. We just got to run this by cash for the next eight weeks. You guys would have panicked. We laugh about it and we go, man, that happened again? And life goes on. 
Wow. Wow. That's, that's, that's incredible. I mean, yeah, of course, in the hedge fund industry, I mean, I think the regulators usually will give us some leeway time, you know, it wouldn't be like overnight and, you know, boom, it changes, right? Because it's such a, well, uh, established business and, you know, the, the uh, feds really know what to do with us. Whereas sure. your industry is very different because it's so new and they want to keep regulating more and more because they don't, there's, they're starting to understand it a lot more as well, I guess. Uh, and uh, they're starting to understand it, and people are fearing it less. I mean, the security apparatuses around dispensaries and grows is so much lax now than it used to be. I mean, when people first started putting up cultivation sites, we just assumed everyone's door would get kicked in and they'd get robbed constantly, and it just never really happened because it devalues as more grows come online, and it such a normalized widget that you know it's easier just to go into a dispensary and buy product and walk out the door and go back in and buy product and assume mass quantities that way than it is to try and kick the door in at a grow and harvest the plants yourself it's easier just to go buy as much weed as you want than it would be to try and rob a dispensary it's mm. all you do is walk out and pay for it so we learned after years of setting up high tech intense security systems that they're just kind of overdone and redundant because at that point it's just easier to just go buy it. Mm. And you know, you never hear about like a liquor manufacturer being robbed. People just don't show up and take cases of beer. There's just no value to it. You know, you're going to hawk a can of beer on the side of the road. It's the same thing. I mean, you don't even see a whole lot of black market activity in Colorado. You see it out of state, you know, Colorado feeds out of state quite a bit, but in state, you don't see people peddling zip <laughs> back so weed it just doesn't make sense you know so and i guess a lot of things will change when the the cannabis law becomes in a well, it will gets legalized in a federal level because you're still dealing with two different sets of uh, laws in the u.s yeah so essentially we run off states rights it's the state's rights to choose and the federal government has backed off and said, we'll let you explore it. And each state is their own Petri dish. We do not interact state to state at all. In CBD, we can. We can ship a lot nationwide. Uh, in fact, we are running some R&D product um, for a group in Japan who we've heard own several hundred retail outlets. Um, and they're interested in our CBD tablets. So we are working on expanding the CBD business internationally. But in the cannabis space, it's just in Colorado. Um, federalization to me, the narrative I tell myself in my head has more cons than pros right now. I like it just in Colorado. I like it as a state's rights thing. It makes me a little nervous to think about someone in Washington dictating how federalization is going to play out. Um, I like my small business. I don't really want it to go anywhere. But, you know, the cards will fall as, as the cards fall. Right, right. Just keep it flexible and nimble. And you during during a pre-recording call, you mentioned that you guys in Colorado operate quite differently from the guys in California. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah. So first off, first off, hats off to everyone in California. You know, again, when you said I was one of the originals, I, I don't disagree with that in Colorado from legalization. But I also understand there's a ton of OGs in Colorado that have been doing it 30, 40, 50 years. So, you know, much respect to all those people and hats off to them. From a legalization standpoint, again, California chose to go with propositions, which, and, and, and I don't want to dive too deep into this, but, you know, it's county to county um, throughout California and, and different propositions allowed different flow and setups. Colorado came in and right into the state constitution. So it's just two totally different programs. Uh, California had different rules and regs. Colorado, um, again, from a top-down standpoint, was a little more organized and kind of had the whole state under one system, where my understanding of California, it was a mixed group of systems. When they started to apply some of the methods from Colorado, you know, there was some meshing going along there. Um, so it's it's been interesting to watch. Um, I think, you know, and that's the thing is California had a more robust 
cannabis trade than Colorado pre-legalization. Um, so I think you saw a lot of that hitting the propositions and the legalization and in, in, in that pathway where in Colorado, it's not that they didn't have a robust uh, cannabis trade pre-legalization. It was a little bit more starting from a, 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 a cleaner slate. Um, and again, just putting it right into the constitution to begin with is just a different approach. Um, and, and also in Colorado, they allowed small businesses and small money to come in and, and, and grow up from a seed level where now a lot of states have massive uh, financial barriers to enter. Uh, I just think the way Colorado mixed up their pot, their stew, was a great recipe for success. I don't think you're going to see it replicated uh, in any other state, but I think a lot of states look at Colorado's current mature system and they map off that, but man, just something was special about the way Colorado did it, in my opinion. Yeah, in Asia, it's very controlled. And I see that, like, let's say in Japan, and you mentioned you're selling your products in Japan, it's only very potentially. recent, potentially. Yeah. Um, and uh, the Minister of Health uh, came out, uh, Ministry of Health came out and, and gave some guidelines on to what kind of CBD products are legal in Japan. But all across Asia, I've seen no THC and the laws around it is still kind of in its infancy and there's a lot of gray zones all over the place so it might be somewhat similar to what you're experiencing in colorado everybody's trying to figure out what is good what is not okay you know how can we import it correctly i mean there's so many layers let's say in japan of getting it the certification of analysis not just that but they want to do their own type of detections and and multiple multiple layers in there and and it seems like hong kong it's very pretty easy i mean this is so much it, it is pretty chaotic in that sense right and, and and for us to prepare for a certain type of legalization structure around it obviously we need to be future proofing our business so that somehow when it when you know stricter laws come in stricter regulations come in we can adapt to that so how do you keep yourself with that kind of future proof business model in mind yeah i mean it's it's been interesting i spent my first five years working for other people's companies in the cannabis space looking for what type of business model I wanted to get myself into. And I think that that saved me quite a bit. You know, I looked several times and, and some of the companies I was working for had expansion plans and I was supposed to be part of them and they just didn't happen. Um, a lot of that was due to just poor organizational and, and leadership skills. The businesses just didn't function like they thought they would. Uh, Capitalization is always an issue. Uh, that was pre I mean, for years, we couldn't accept outside money in Colorado. You had to set up, and people don't like when you say this word, but shell companies along the way to transfer funds and get them in, and it was hectic. Um, I kept my eye on what was going to work um, in that long term and what layer and level was most stable in the industry, and that's where I got into wholesaling. So I leverage other people's risk. Uh, you know, I represent cultivators who have a decent amount of overhead and have to have big teams and I represent their product. And then I have a network of dispensaries who buy wholesale product who don't have the resources or don't want to put the resources in their procurement. And I stay in the middle of all of them and I mix and match products and needs and price points and create the, the flow of deals. Um, so I'm essentially, I'm a trader, a cannabis trader. Um, and I found that to be a great niche for myself. Again, I drove eight hours today. I drove to the one side of the state and all the way back up and I just have a blast doing it. But I kept my eye on what my niche was going to be. Um, I think it's super important is, you know, people have this draw to cultivation and man, cultivation is a great layer to be on if you can conquer that beast and it's a beast. Doing a lot of due diligence um, is super important, and there's just nothing better than boots on the ground experience. If you want to get into cultivation, go spend a week on a farm, mm -hmm. and you'll go, wow, wow. And this ain't just throwing, you know, seeds in the ground and, and, and you know, getting some tomatoes or some corn. I mean, this is a high-level crop that takes a ton of attention. 
it's hard to say, you know, and then again, understanding that this is going to go from like a ha 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 weed people smoke weed and eat Cheetos kind of thing to a very high level product where we're going to be isolating cannabinoids at, at a pharmaceutical level and, and, and where in between do you want your business model and, and what do you want to, who do you want to look at for inspiration to go? I want that. Mm-hmm. I've seen some really successful cultivation sites that are not very visually impressive mm-hmm. and they tweak the buildings and then they grew into something overly impressive. And I've seen a lot of people put just incredible greenhouses in the ground and, and they didn't know how to cultivate. So, you know, they went broke. I think starting in the least expensive manner possible and in, in testing your theory and then where do you grow don't over capitalize don't get so much capital tied up in your business that you you can't get it repaid we see that all the time in colorado mm-hmm. i just sold 50 pounds of greenhouse flour from last week to today and it's the 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 greenhouse is beautiful it's high tech it's top of the line the product's mid-grade at best so they're not getting the 1900 a pound. I sold it on average for like 1250 How are you going to pay the bills if you wrote your pro formas at 18 1900 You're not. Mm-hmm. They could have got the same product out of a hoop house, which is metal with plastic and grown outdoors. They could have got the same product. Mm-hmm. And rather than be, you know, $5 million in on their greenhouse, they could have been half a million in and, and got the same product. So really, who are you versus who you think you are is important to see in cannabis, especially in cultivation. If I had a nickel for every person that said they were going to grow the best weed in Colorado and didn't, hmm. my teeth would be, you know, nickel plated grill. You know, I'd have, you know, I, I, I'd be sitting on a yacht doing this interview. I, I think that's very important. Humility, as you said before, get in and get hands on and really see what your skill set. I had no idea it was going to be a wholesaler. Mm. I had no idea. I was thinking I was going to make widgets kind of like CBD. We love doing the tablets. I thought that would be my path in cannabis, making a product. I'm trading other people's products. I kind of fell into it, but I really took my time and watched what happened on the different levels and layers in the industry. Um, I would not be in a hurry. You're not going to miss the boat. Don't be in a massive hurry and get into a level or layer that's not made for you. Take your time and find that fit. Yeah, that's a huge word of advice. I mean, I think a lot of people jump to conclusions very quickly and say, I want to do that or I want to do this and and jump into it and then they fail. And they think, oh, this industry is not for me. But the thing is, you have to have to mold yourself into the industry, right? Especially in a new industry uh, like yeah. cannabis. So um, now that we've seen a lot of retail products out in the market and we, you know, a lot of them say full spectrum, you know, broad distillery, all these things are coming out. But, you know, from the regular consumer's eyes, they all kind of look the same. So how do you start to differentiate your product in this market where there's so many different companies making more or less the same thing? Yeah, that's, you know, that's a great question. And again, um, do you want a branded product or do you want a commodity and I don't think there's anything wrong with commoditized products. I've made some companies some really strong revenue streams selling commoditized products. Um, you know, I think that's important. Everyone wants to be a branded product and a premium product. Great. I've sold more unbranded commodities or low to middle grade products. And I think a lot of times those companies have done better. They're good products, but you know, not everything is going to be a premium product. I think that's a great place to start. Um, the cannabis space is full of Me Too products. Something gets hot and pops and everyone runs after it. I think finding a lane is super important as well. And, you know, like let's say pre-rolls. I worked with a company and in theory they were going to be the next big craze in the cannabis space for pre-rolls. It didn't happen. They had a great product. They weren't able to, to scale it. They ran out of money in scaling. But, you know, think about that, like, if you make a great pre-roll and you can sell it branded, but you could also run that machine and pack other people's pre-rolls, 
how valuable will that be when cannabis federalizes in, in the U.S. is going to be massive because it's really difficult to roll cannabis pre-rolls. You know, if they would have stayed in that lane and really focused on that, they could have something really special in the next couple of years when um, it federalizes. You know, is there anything in your brand or your product that you can have IP, especially on the, the manufacturing process, to scale it up? Our big focus in CBD is we're dialing in our tablet formulas and tableting process. Tableting CBD is not the easiest thing in the world. Uh, our goal in 2021 is to take on co-manufacturing product uh, uh, contracts and process other people's CBD into tablets to hit the market on that upstream layer of, you know, someone in Japan with 600 retail stores will supply your bulk tablets mm -hmm. and staying out of the hustle and bustle. That's an upstream layer that I like to be on. It's similar to wholesaling. I think I'm in a great position as a wholesaler. Um, but again, I also think that uh, some brands failure comes from them trying to be overly technical. I mean, at the end of the day, it's wheat. You know, like nanotech has not made a footprint in this industry. I've seen so many brands come in and, ah, oh, nano this and nano that. I can light a blunt and it's cool. Nano's not that cool. It just hasn't found, not, not that nano won't, nano hasn't. You know, just want to put that out there. But, you know, like smokables, flour is hot. Flour is the most sold product, followed by concentrates, dabs. Edibles are the least selling product category in Colorado. And, you know, a lot of people, again, get into the industry and they're going to make the next big chocolate bar. And I'm like, man, have you done any research? Like, why are you getting into edibles? One, there's 15 chocolate bars in the marketplace. Two, edibles just really don't sell. Mm. So it's interesting to see what people gravitate to and towards. But, I mean, my eye is always on commodities what are people going to want the most of, mm. you know, not as much as branded. And, and, and I think it's important for people to roll that around in their head that you can over technicalize cannabis weeds, weed to a certain point, you know, good weeds. Great. You know, but it's interesting to watch people try and make it too complex. And, 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 you know, it's uh, the average person, you know, it's, it's, it's like, uh, you know, uh, um, not a high-end car like a Ferrari, but a custom car, right? If you get in your garage and you build your own car, it might have 1,200 horsepower and sweet pipes and be the coolest custom car ever, but custom cars break down. You pull them out of the driveway, you got to sit there and tune it to get to the grocery store. A Buick, you can drive across the country and have a great road trip. Take the Buick, and there's nothing wrong with a Buick. So I think people eyes light up and again, they want to make a bigger impact. I'm a commodities guy all day long. I make a good living wholesaling commodities. And I, you know, I mean, think about how many people crush it selling corn. That's super boring. They're sitting on their yacht. And then the corn man or corn woman, the coolest person you've ever met, you know? So I, I personally, I think it would be interesting if people focused on that. And, and how many cool things are in that, that commodity space rather than a, a niche technology or niche brand. For a lot of people wanting to get into the industry, I mean, I have spoken to a, a good friend of mine back in Canada, and he has seen the industry become uh, in, initially be a vertical consolidation turn into a, you know, a, a break into small little pieces of specialized companies in the value chain. I mean, what, what do you see uh, going forward in this industry? Yeah, so originally we were forced into vertical integration in Colorado. A medical dispensary had to cultivate 70% of what they sold each month. Now there's a reason behind that, and that reason is we had no software to track stuff. Mm -hmm. So they were just gonna have cultivation sites and dispensaries, and they did. And again, because it was so new, we were learning on the fly. All of a sudden, they were saying, okay, wait. We actually have no idea how much weight comes out of a cultivation space. You're telling us you produce 100 pounds a month, which would have been a ton of weight back then. Let's say 10 pounds a month. 
how do we know you're not producing 20? You just told us 10. So if that other 10 is going out the back door because it's worth $4,000 a pound on the street, but $2,000 a pound. So they halted that and they said merge and they forced marriages and said, this dispensary has to marry a grow now. And again, going back to timelines, we're not a hedge fund. So they didn't give us six months. They said, now, figure it out today, 30 days, merge. And then you have to show through your, when you, when you harvest and then your sales receipts from your dispensary, that was their first tracking system. So it was a forced marriage. Well, once we finally got technology and RFID tags and, 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 and it normalized and people understood that, you know, 100 lights with 50 plants is going to average this much weight. So if you tell us you're only getting five pounds off that setup, we know you're BS and us and, and you should be pulling 25 pounds down. So there's a way to have normalization and expectations. Vertical integration is decent. Um, a lot of people have been very successful with just having dispensaries or just having grows. And then you see certain companies who have some cultivation, but they still wholesale in. What's interesting is the standalone grows negatively affect the price of the market because if you have a dispensary and the industry is flooded with flour and there's a surplus, you can push it through your dispensary at a higher price than just wholesaling it. But the standalone grows who don't have that outlet tank the price in the market like twice a year seasonally and prices will just plummet and people with grows and dispensaries back out, throw deals in their dispensary and ride it out. So there's a little bit of value to being vertically integrated to a certain extent, but then there's also a devalue because some people just can't grow or can't run a retail shop. So, you know, right now there's, some advantage but i mean some companies used to grow extract make edibles and sell them out of their dispensary and that's you know kind of when you're a jack of all trades and a master and nothing you know but then you see other successful companies i mean cbd and our tablet i went toward their facility and they have almost everything in house but they're also 45 years old and they slowly vertically integrated and brought things in when they could capitalize and do it right so that initial forced vertical integration kind of threw everything for a little bit of a loop. Um, I'd say probably 50-50 split on people who were able to handle it correctly and people who couldn't. A lot of that had to do with the forced marriages. You know, some folks just didn't get along professionally. Ultimately, you know, I think you're going to see specialization, especially when it comes to scale. You know, there's a big difference between cultivating 100 lights and 100,000 lights. There's a difference between cultivating indoors versus greenhouse versus outdoors. So as industry scales up and the need for volume and quantity grows, you're probably going to see more specialization. Um, there's certain shops that just crush customer service and dispensaries. And if they're able to organize that and sort of corporatize it and then replicate it, you know, there's people with 20 shops that just do a fantastic job, have a similar experience. They have merchandisers, purchasers. That's a lot of infrastructure to keep straight. You know, you're not just buying product for one shop. You're doing it over 20, you know, and, and it's interesting to see um, that. But I would say ultimately you're, you're, you're going to see a lot of separation of, of the vertical. Um, and then you'll probably see um, then a buyback, right? People separating and then people getting lumped under a bigger parent company as well, which, you know, mm. you, you see a lot in big industry, but they let other people specialize first and then they purchase them into the parent company. Mm. Yeah, I think that's kind of what we see it in, yeah, as you say, tech companies or even co highly commoditized companies as well, uh, You just or pharmaceutical companies as well. You just buy these companies that do random R&Ds and they come up with a brand and you just buy them all, right? So I, I, sure. I totally see that. But And then what do you see in these vi very different specialized industries and where do you think there's a lot of hot money in? Because... You know, people who are getting into this industry, they might be thinking, should I grow? Should I build a, uh, a brand? Should I do extraction? I mean, there, there's a lot of, you know, um, businesses within the value chain. I mean, where do you see a lot of money going into? 
I mean, honestly, it's 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 tough to say. You know, I mean, look at hemp at CBD. Um, kilos of oil in 2015 were selling for fifty thousand dollars a kilo, and now I can buy a kilo isolate for five hundred bucks. You know, isolate was fifteen grand. I mean, we paid at Mount Maid. We were paying, you know, a factor of ten different for our molecule a year and a half ago than we are now. Mm. You know, that's that's a decimal point in the wrong direction. Mm. You know, everyone that was the hot money and everyone got into it and it collapsed really quick. Um, retail stores for CBD were hot money. Um, I would go. I mean, <laughs> for me, the hot money is always the coldest spot in the pool, right? That's going to be the next cool kid spot is where no one's at right now. Mm. You know, that to me is where I always tend to look is what aren't people doing tablets, CBD tablets, aren't that cool right now. It's coming, right? Tincture is not going to hold as much market share as, you know, people think it will. It's, it's a dead product category. No one uses tincture in Colorado in the cannabis space. It's antiquated. It's ridiculous. So we won't touch it. CBD tablets will be cool. They're not cool right now. We're not, you know, we're in the cold spot of the pool. We're not in that hot zone. You know, what molecule, I mean, I just heard someone has access to THCV. That's going to be hot. Delta 8 is about to be hot. You know, those things weren't even accessible. Uh, personally, I always tend to look at what's not cool and then seeing if you can get it. Pre-rolls were not cool. Pre-rolls, no one smoked pre-rolls. They had a bad rap. When I helped the company get off the ground, they went from 700 units a month to 65,000 in six months. You know, we got their sales up that much in six months. That's incredible. That's a factor of almost 100, right? I mean, two decibel points in the right direction. Three. So, you know, what isn't cool that can be cool is, I think, a great place to start because the cannabis and hemp space has such a habit of me too people mm -hmm. that chase, chase, chase because they're in a hurry. They want to make a quick buck. Well, you're not the only person that thinks that, you know, it's like buying a stock is it's it is crest. You might as well wait for it to collapse a little and buy a bit lower. Why would you throw all that money into trying making the same product someone else's? And again, that just kind of comes with time and experience and having a pulse of the market. Uh, not just jumping onto the next new thing um, can be super important. And there's plenty of room. There's so much in the what we don't know we don't know right now that there's time to make an impact and not be in a hurry into the wrong direction, especially if what you're doing is capital intensive. Uh, personally, I would slam on the brakes and, and, and slow it down. I started my wholesale company off five grand. And I can tell you it's ROI factors mm -hmm. of that. You know, I was $5,000 startup and the things sustained me for six years. We live on two acres. We do just fine. You know, it was five grand, took a risk. And, and it's been great. Awesome. I mean, you have so much plethora of knowledge of this industry and different value chains and, and how to survive as well. So just for our parting uh, thoughts, can you give us some, and, uh, and I, you already gave us so much already, but are, are there anything that you would like to drop on the people who are starting businesses uh, in Asia, in this cannabis space? What is one thing that you want them to take away from your experiences? Yeah. I mean, find, find a passion in it. You know, I, I tell people don't buy too much into the, the, the podcast that you just heard from me. Just know that it's easy for me to get onto a podcast for 60 minutes and sound super calm, cool, collected. And, and this has been an epic 11 year journey that's broke me several times, uh, physically, spiritually, financially. Um, you know, I struggle just like everyone else. I'm going to get up tomorrow and, and maybe I'll have a bad day, but that's part of being a small business owner and entrepreneur. If you have a passion for it, you'll grind through even the, the toughest days and, 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 you know, a little bit of rain is going to bring you a lot of bit of sunshine. Um, just know that, you know, again, we, we have a tendency to see and hear things and hear them. Look at the struggle 
that's gotten successful people to where they're at. Jeff Bezos, you know, I mean, how many people made fun of him selling books out of his garage? You know, that was not the hot button item to do. You know, I mean, look at how many super successful people were doing something that just was not that cool when they started doing it and they believed in it and they, you know, took that path and, and, and just really forged forward. Don't buy into the heroization of people you see today. Look at their past and heroize the struggle that got them to where they're at so they could sit here for 60 minutes and maybe speak eloquently about a subject. But man, what you want to look at is that struggle, the days that they cried themselves to sleep to make it one more day because, you know, they were so close to their goals. If I would have quit mid-2015, I wouldn't have made it to August of 2015. And, and trust me, I was broke. I was crying myself to sleep. I had no food in the fridge. And then, boom, it changed. August of 2015, my life changed. And that was five years of struggle I put in for one phone call, for one consulting deal that transferred five grand into my bank account. And I had $70 left. I was broke. And I took that five grand and I knew that would last me three months if I was careful with my money and I was able to chase down wholesale deals. And I turned that five grand into a lot more than five grand. But, you know, if you would have heard Mike Patch in 2015 in July speak, you'd have been like, I don't want to be that guy at all. Right. So I, that's still me. That's still the same person. Just know that, that if you're struggling right now, you, you might be on the right path. Awesome, Mike. I mean, this is so much good information, good motivation, and great amount of knowledge that we can get, get from you. So thank you so much for your time and uh, hope to speak to you again. Yeah, thank you. would love to anytime. Hi, this is your host, Takatoshi Shibayama. Thank you for listening all the way to the end. Now, if you enjoyed or disliked the show, please let me know by writing in the comment section. The only way I can improve or add value to you is through your voices. If there are any topics that you would like me to pick up, please also let me know in the comments. I'd love to start chatting with you all. And if you would like to continue watching the show, please subscribe. Thank you.